Hi, good evening. Today is September 3rd. Um, let's start with a COVID update. It's been an interesting week on that front as the Western countries, which are supposedly free and democratic, are implementing more and more restrictions on their citizens. For example, in Australia, now there are reports that their government wants to put in applications on users' phone so that at random times they could text you and you have to take your picture and location enabled to see where you are, how far away are you within the allowed walking distance from your home. It sounds incredible that this is even being discussed. 1984 has nothing on it because they didn't have the iPhones as we do now to keep tracking of our whereabouts. And if people think this is just going to go away with COVID, you know, I, I don't think so. It's, it's easy to give up the freedoms. It's not so easy to get them back. In Canada and Alberta, they're announcing new COVID restrictions. Another example, it will actually have liquor sales curfews. Somehow COVID is, you know, afraid of that. Uh, they will ask unvaccinated people to limit their social contacts and delayed return of, to office for government workers and maybe implement the mask mandates. Meanwhile, in the totalitarian countries like Belarus and Russia, Putin said that, you know, that great dictator that everybody's afraid of, Putin said that vaccination is the main weapon against the spread of the virus. But importantly, no one should be forced to get a vaccine. And pressures where people may lose their jobs even less acceptable. So I wonder again, what happened to democracy in the West when Putin and Belarus have more freedoms than lots of the Western countries? And if we look at the chart, for example, as far as the mass vaccinations go, we could see that the rates of rates of um, COVID cases climb the same in the same rate in Israel between vaccinated and vaccinate and unvaccinated people. Uh, thus again questioning the efficacy of the vaccine. Israel is the highest vaccinated country on the planet, almost pretty much. And yet they had 11,000 new cases on Monday, the highest single day cases since the start of the pandemic. And in the next few days, the number of cases is also keeps increasing. So as they keep increasing the vaccination, so do the number of cases. And like I said, we need to start investigating this. Meanwhile, if we look at the chart of excess mortality, you could see that in Belarus had an increase of excess mortality in last year, and then another one in this year. And now it doesn't have it anymore. So what does it tell us about herd immunity and how does vaccination, lockdown and masks affect that herd immunity? Do they actually make the pandemic worse is the question that we all should be asking. Because looking at this data, it's clear that all of the neighboring countries like Poland, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Bulgaria, they are having yet another spike with all of their restrictions. And Belarus has zero restrictions and had, has had zero restrictions for a while. Never any lockdowns, no mask mandates. And people barely wore, wore masks in the beginning of the pandemic and now certainly nobody does. And if we compare Belarus to Sweden, we could see that it's a very similar trajectory of excess mortality originally, and now both of these countries, Belarus and Sweden, do not have it as the rest of them do. So somebody really needs to look at this data to see what are we doing with vaccination as far as the pandemic. Or, or the, in this case, it's the lockdowns. And that, the lockdowns. That, that are, uh, they didn't have any lockdowns in Sweden or Belarus. Right. And, and so like, what's what's the value of these lockdowns and uh, right uh, and masking right masking right especially with the masks that uh you know like cloth masks or paper masks that don't actually filter a virus they might block like droplets or something like that but they don't if the virus is airborne then they, they don't do any right. anything to stop that right but <laughs> you know nobody cares and moderna 
vaccine maker had a almost 5% update, even though there were some reports of contamination in this vaccine in Japan in multiple batches. But Moderna said, well, it's stainless steel. Don't worry about it. Lots of stuff made from stainless steel in your body, like valves. So it should all be good. But uh, let's talk about the economic data. Consumer confidence crashed this week as business conditions dropped and inflation was up. One year inflation expectations have soared to 6.8 from 6.6. It's the highest since 2008. On top of this, the housing data, if you look at the case Schiller index, index um, the home prices in America's 20 largest cities have increased at 19% year over year, up from 17% <laughs> the month before. It's the highest pace on the record, surprising, even surpassing the housing bubble of 2005 and 2006. And on top of this, it's the third consecutive month of record growth in housing prices. So, you know, why is anybody surprised that consumer confidence crashed uh, in this month? Because people can buy ha homes. They, 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 they're feeling squeezed financially. The stimulus ran out. And so in inflation keeps going up. If we look at the shipping container prices, it's going off the chart literally every week. There is no uh, slowdown there. And just pure anecdotal evidence, but in Florida, when I talk to various construction companies, nobody's willing to give me um, any kind of estimates that are valid longer than 30 days. 30 days is as long as it gets. It used to be a year. They will give me an estimate for half a year to a year. Now they're like, is 10 days okay? <laughs> you know, so because, and you speak to people and they're saying, well, we thought it's going to be transitory. And, but now we see that there is no any slowdown coming and they're finding any excuse, hurricane in Louisiana, uh, port closures in China, whatever excuse, but the prices don't see any uh, signs of abating. And today we also saw a disappointing employment report, obviously. And, but the market today was pretty much closed and changed, maybe down like one and a half points. And if we look at the last 10 employment reports date, it's interesting that there was only one down day in one of, of the 10. It was also down one point. So, now it seems that the employment report days are obviously very bullish so many days in a row or so many times in a row already it wasn't really a, you know the, it didn't deter the market at all it's because right. of this uh everything's being done to um flood the market or just flood the whole economy with money and it's it's going on into the market it's going everywhere else still housing so on right and uh what was the option expirations probably also there was a bit uh, pin related activity today but bonds uh, had um, a down week and also the US dollar sold off as well and it's kind of on the verge of uh, breaking out some sort of significant level let's look uh, at it get a daily chart here so it's um yeah, it's uh, looking kind of not looking very good right now. Kind of right at a right at a critical level, sitting right here at this right. um, this kind of uh, wouldn't call it a neckline. It's not like a head and shoulders or something, but it is it is um, you know at this kind of support level where it could break and then retest say the eighty eight level. Uh, I think. Right, we talked about the fake breakout last uh, time last week. And so that continued. We had what seven or something down days in a row for US dollar or something like that. Uh, oh, so, um, but let's talk back to SP 500. It was an incredible August. Uh, we made 12, 12 new all time highs intraday in August for SP 500. Uh, and it, this hasn't happened for the month of August since well in 1987 we had 11 
new all-time highs intraday. And the record before this August was in 1929. It was 11. So 10 and 87, 11 and 29, and now we have 12. So it's kind of interesting. And as, as I run down the statistics, it's interesting that those years keep popping up compared to the data, to, to the S&P price action that is happening right now. And I'm not saying that we're going to have this unexpected crash like 1987. I'm just saying that it's interesting that the statistical data is picking up these two years. So, well, the thing that I would I would point out that that may be a parallel uh, is that uh, in 1987 the dollar uh, started moving down in August uh, 87 and it moved down pretty pretty sharply through September, uh, even while the market kept going up uh, for a little while. The market actually I think topped out in in August, September, and was headed down. And, but the dollar was moving down more rapidly. And it was the, the crash, which was in late October, was um, really precipitated by uh, the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, James Baker, who said that they weren't going to defend the dollar. And, and you know, Monday morning opened down, whatever, several mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hundred points on the Dow. Um, but but I think that this um, it, it it bears watching the dollar uh, to see if we see a, a significant dollar weakness, and uh, but yet continue continued like turning around in the market. It could be a warning sign, uh, a little bit of a warning sign, not that a, of a crash, but of, a, that there might be some bear moves to come. I think. Right. So if we look at more interesting data. For example, if we look at all of the years where S&P 500 closed in August 10% or more, we have closed August 20 plus percent. But if we look at all of the years where August is 10 plus percent up, uh, in four months later, 22 out of 25 years, I mean, we, the market was high 22 out of 25 times with on average 5% up move. If we look at only the years where we had 20 plus percent move by the end of the August, uh, since 1954, there were only seven times and we closed higher six out of those seven times. And again, the only year where we did not close higher, it was, 1987, it was down 25% till the end of the year. And another year was 1929, where it was down 30% at the end of the year. But 1929, the S&P 500 was slightly different number of components or whatever, different structure. So it's hard to compare. But still, since 1954, it was up six out of seven times with the only time 1987. So like I said, it's funny how those years being picked up by the same statistics. Also, S&P 500 had a monthly winning, winning streak of seven months in a row. And again, since 1957, there are 13 times when this happened. And only five out of those 13 times, the streak ended on seven. So the majority of time, the streak continued to make high uh, winning streak again. And only two did not have a drawdown in the future. So the vast majority of them had the drawdown. So that's why I'm kind of also, while overall the bullishness obviously may continue, the pullback of three to 5% is very likely and it's probably will be a buy because again, five months later or six months later, the index never closed lower. So again, after seven months winning streaks in half a year later, median gain is 10%, never closed lower. While seven straight months of gain is very impressive, we actually had 11, three different times in the 50s. And one of those times, when we had 20% by the end of August, we actually had another 20% by the end of the year rally. 
in 1954. So, you know, when you look at statistics like this, on one hand, you had 87 with a 25% down. And on the other hand, you have 54 with a 20% up. So it, it, it's a very small number to compare, but judging by this, it's um, very hard, at least for me, to figure out which statistics uh, to look at. I think it's, um, you know, one of the things that I watch is I'm, I'm looking at some things like cyclical stocks like Alcoa that are now trading at multi-year highs. This is the highest that it's been. It just really got back to uh, 2000, early 2018 levels where 2018 was a very bad year for cyclical stocks. Uh, there was when there was the volatility blow up at the beginning of 2018. Um, the, the rest of the year, these all trended down very sharply. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm now, you know, bringing in, multi, you can't see the candles, but you can see the data that, that um, it's now finally back to this early 2018 level. And, and it's the same for stocks like uh, US Steel, or I mean, even like a, now Valero is a little bit more tied to like, a, you know, the, the, the crack spread and, and um, the economy, but but I'm just looking at, at stocks like um, you know, steel, Alcoa, and so on. And these are these are you know it's it's a bullish signal, and it's hard to um, <laughs> it's hard to deny the bullishness of that signal, um, and and that the real economy is doing well now. It may be. Um, building in some assumptions around infrastructure spending or whatever, but I, I don't think so. I think that it's, um, there, there's actually signs that that infrastructure bill may be in trouble just because um, it's going to cost so much, 3.4 trillion or whatever. And so um, there, there's a sign, I, I think there's a good chance it actually won't pass in its present form. It'll get redone somehow, but I still think it, if you look at uh, the, the sick bulls, but then some stocks like the Amazon, for example, which it was, it was most the reason that the, um, that the uh, NASDAQ was up today, right? It, was, uh, it would have been down today, along with Russell 2000 had um, Amazon, yeah, here we go. Amazon up you know, a good 14 points today, you know, almost half a percent. You kind of drag the NASDAQ up. And um, uh, down a little bit after hours, but, but still, you, you've got some really nice rallies in some of these um, big cap stocks. And then I'm, you know, I'll look at something like uh, the Arc Innovation Fund, which I don't, you know, it's, it's sort of very controversial um, ETF, but it, it, um, it turned around its. 200 day moving average. And I think it, it just broke up above it uh, this week. And I, I think it could rally pretty sharply uh, just based on one, the uh, where the market is and um, kind of the bullish underpinning of the market in terms of the monetary underpinning. But then I think there's a lot of um, short interest and, and, um, it's um, a good contrary play to to go against um, the shorters in a bull market, which I think this is. Um, uh, I, I think this could rally pretty significantly, you know, a good 10, 10, 15 percent from here. So, I it's it's hard for me to get too bearish in the near term. Now, longer term, by the end of the year, that's a different matter, but. I, I think it, you know, it, it could very well be kind of a blow off kind of top and then maybe it, it struggles for a while, but, but I think that the underpinnings of the market are, are pretty bullish right now from a monetary standpoint and from just looking at the price action. Um, well, just a funny thing to add about ARC now that we're talking about it, Kathy yeah. tweeted a uh, couple of days ago that um, she is saying that US order sales dropped 30% uh, in August since February because uh, the 
buyers are abandoning gas powered vehicles in favor of electric. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, it's nothing even to do with the hurry TF, but the statement alone is so absurd that this kind of, I'm, I can't believe she's texting it. The reason prices are down because there's an, I mean, sales are down is because there's a huge shortage of inventory and prices of used cars are higher than the new ones. There's shortage of inventory of new vehicles, used vehicles, all vehicles. And so the prices are skyrocketing and people can't afford them. Uh, but she somehow figured that it has to do because people want to buy EV vehicles. Um, mm. So I don't even know to, what to say about her. But no, it's uh, it's not not true. But it's um, but I, I think it has a lot more to do with the like the the, the supply of vehicles right. and the pricing is just uh, going through the roof. Um, without the financing changing significantly, uh, and but. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I do think it's um it's it's kind of a bullish setup still, and it's hard to get too bearish. I mean, I'm not saying that there can't be good uh, moves on the downside to play. There are sort of counter trend moves. We may be coming up on that kind of move where it can make you know, sense to be short a couple days in a row. But it's right. it's just um kind of market where it's where it's hard to view it as it's topping out, I guess is what I'm, what right. I'm saying. I, I don't, I don't see that right now, a, a big topping action, such as what happened in um, late summer, early fall in 1987. And, and the, the topping in, let's say 2007 happened, it happened in 2007, in October, 2007, not in um, 2008 at all, even though people associate 2008 as being that, a bad year, it actually topped S and P topped out in late two thousand and seven. In twenty nine, it actually topped out in two thousand nineteen twenty eight, right? Uh, not twenty nine, uh, even though it crashed in twenty nine. Um, it's and then kept sliding until thirty two. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't. Um, it, the, the topping happened long before that, so. Well, September is also now, interestingly, 11th consecutive month with the new all-time highs for S&P 500. Uh -huh. And so I agree that the, the, it's not likely that we just reach the all-end top. But at the same time, I think a pullback next week uh, is uh, likely. Uh -huh. For example, 3% pullback not, or 5% pullback, not necessarily in one week before we rally into the end of the year is something that would not uh, surprise me at all. And I actually would surprise me if we don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was June. It's been June of last year. Um, so like, like um, really uh, 15 months since the S&P 500 has touched its 200 day moving average, which I mean, how it, it's not, not tested it since then. It's just been a, a rip off. Well, uh, forget the 200-day moving average. Look at the other moving average. The, well, the 50, uh, yeah, well, I'm just saying it's been, right. it has tapped the 50 more recently than that, but that's a 50-day moving average. In my view, it's like, right. you know, the, the really, the only significant pullback was here in, um, like, like uh, I guess, in the, in the uh, September through uh, November timeframe of last year, where we did have some kind of a, a pullback and it was this kind of double bottom action that um, that it was pretty bullish actually and and for it to race right back up to its near its previous level and then move higher that was it was very bullish but it's just not not tested this and now <laughs> this is significantly higher than it was you know, um, I mean, is significantly higher. I mean, we we went right. above the pre-COVID high and um, you know, just have moved another thirty percent above that. So it's, it's right. Hard. So th that's what that's what's amazing is that we are so much higher than the pre-COVID economy, and uh, it's um, the, the the market is definitely disconnected from the economy, and often it's not an uh, anomaly or anything. But it's like the, the I I think that despite the Fed 
um, you know, every now and then making a few hawkish statements, there's absolutely no um, Fed discipline at all. They're perfectly happy to flood the market with as much money as need be. And they're doing that. And they're, they're flooding it with everything. And um, it's, it's, we're, we're beyond all any kind of historic comparison in terms of what the Fed's doing. There's even the 70s where there was, you know, they supposedly didn't pull away the punch ball fast enough and so on. I mean, it goes so far beyond that. It's, there's no. Right, but at the same time, I could argue in 1954, the market was up another 20% since the 20% before August. So the Fed wasn't really doing much QE back then. So, and also in, in the 50s, that had three different times, 11 straight months of gains. So it's, it's hard to say that the market is driven purely by the Fed printing or whatever we want to call it, QE, buying back. Um, it's just human nature. Hmm. Yeah, I think also, I mean, there was um, a, um, you know, a, a, no, I would say maybe, you know, the 64 is a good parallel just because there was um, in 62, there was a, a bear market. And then, and uh, of course, in 63, the Kennedy assassination had hit the market, uh, kind of lowered confidence for a while. But then 64 was this, you know, very, very bullish year and uh, was kind of shaking off the previous two years and, and the uncertainty in the market. Uh, but, but it was um, a time of not the Fed uh, opening up the spigots, but the um, the uh, fiscal policy being extremely um, pro cyclical, you know, pushing money into the into the into the economy. Um, so, yeah, but I but I I think uh, what I'm what I'm seeing in terms of things like the um, I mean, even like gold today had a nice move. Uh, nice move up. Uh, it's not. You know, it's still well below its its high. It's not anything like um, you know, uh, what I would expect to see if this were really an inflationary boom. But maybe it's maybe that inflationary boom um, is happening in cryptocurrency and not in precious metals. Um, well, it, it's also interesting. There are a few other things I just wanted to ask you about. For example, yeah. just starting with the fun fact that combined market caps of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google are now larger than Japan's entire index of 2,200 companies. So uh -huh. a, a, a few of what, one, two, three, four, four companies in US are the leading NASDAQ, like you were saying, and keeping it up are larger now than the, the, the whole Japan market. And so it kind of tying back to what happened the other day that Japanese prime minister uh, resigned and Japanese market liked it and it was quite on the rally. Do you, do you look at uh, that at all? Does that signify anything for US market? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe it's, um, you know, the, the, uh, that rallying on you know, bad news in Afghanistan or this uh, chaotic pull out or whatever happened, people clinging on the side of the plane and falling from uh, 2000 feet or whatever. Um, uh, it, it's, um, it, it's a sort of thing that, you know, the market rallied anyway, just shrugged it off and rallied anyway. So, yeah. uh -huh. Well, another interesting thing also is that Apple now is bigger than a hundred largest companies in UK. And as far as that, there's also an interesting news that came out this week, perhaps maybe marking the top in Apple. You know, it's a, it's a you know, dangerous thing to say, given how much Apple right now. But Apple's biggest revenue is coming from not necessarily selling iPhones, which is also big, but from their subscription, from, from the fees that they get from the applications that they sell. And so the multiple companies sued them. And so Apple is slowly allowing the developers of the apps to link 
and download and charge rather their applications directly from their website. So Apple will be collecting a lot less fees from the developers of the apps than they have been before. So given that it's one of the largest revenue sources, perhaps that may affect Apple a little bit at least. And that's NASDAQ by extension. And so another risk factor that kind of was maybe slightly highlighted this week was in China, the property market, one of the biggest developers in the property market, I forgot what its name, Ever Grande, Ever Green, something like that. It's kind of on the verge of defaulting as well. Most likely it will be bailed out by, by the Chinese government. So that's another headline risk for the next week. And so if we look at the possibility of um, just a light pullback, 3% pullback in S&P 500, it really is about 130 points and 5% is 230 points. So pullback to 4420 is 3%. It's really not that significant. So that what I would expect if we pull back, the, 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 the first target is 4420 on S&P. Yes, 500. And the um, fall trigger is 4490. So that's, we discussed this many times. As long as we're above 4490, the bullishness kind of continues. But um, 4500, 4490 is the level. If we break, then 3% pullback is 4420, and 5% is 4320. It, seemed so far away now as the market is obviously trading up but the few other pullbacks we had they were pretty much very sharp three percent and then they v back into all new time highs so the three to five percent pullback is going to be obviously bought and all new time highs are likely again and the rally into the end of the year but um let's talk about uh, the fun stuff the nft craze that's going on yep. it's, it's basically what's fu fueling ethereum as far as i understand because most nfts are kind oh, of yeah. sold as part of the blockchain and so people by buying and selling nft they have to buy and sell ethereum and so uh, and the second catalyst for ethereum rally which was an amazing rally it was a uh, reese witherspoon actually tweeted that she just bought her first ethereum it kind of reminds me of Tom Brady when he had his uh, diamond eyes or whatever they were called when that precipitated a few days before their pullback for the last uh, rally. So I'm wondering if uh, Reese Witherspoon. You don't have to buy Ethereum to buy uh, NFTs. You can buy it with any, uh, uh, and, and often they're bought, they're, they are bought with um, with Ether, but they're, they're also bought with um uh, stable coins like USDC and so on that that are also on the Ethereum chain, and um, and mm -hmm. so it's it's not necessarily Ether. Uh, the the thing that really has been the driver of the rally, in my view, uh, it's not NFTs, but it's uh, it may be uh, in part, but I think it's the combination of that and um, EIP fifteen fifty nine, which went in to place. Um, uh, several weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago. And what's happened since then is there's been um, over $500 million worth of Ether burned as a result of transaction, the, the change in the um, way transaction fees are processed. So essentially $500 million worth of Ether just uh, destroyed. And as, as part of this, um, this new, um, uh, this new part of the protocol. And, um, and so that, in other words, instead of having 12,000 new ether hit the market every day that, um, that that's being generated through transaction processing and mining, um, it's been cut roughly by a little bit more than half. And, um, and so it's a much less inflationary Currency and there's not the supply coming uh, that needs to be sold off because miners don't want to hold. It's just like if you're a if you're a farmer or a um, or 
or a coal miner or whatever, or a gold miner, you, you, you'll hold some inventory, but you're not going to hold everything in what the commodity that you're mining because it, it puts you at risk, right? So you have to cash it in, you have to sell it at market. And that's what um, an Ethereum miner does is they've got, they've got bills to pay. You know, they've got to pay for their electricity and, and so on. And so they, uh, they sell, they periodically sell. And so there's this constant selling pressure on the market as a result of, um, as a result of mining, which goes away when Ethereum becomes a proof of state chain. But, but in the near term, EIP-1559 has cut that new supply uh, hugely. And as I said, 500 million have just been burned. It's just gone and, uh, just in the last three weeks. So it's, um, I think that, and, and the fact that is that when all of these transactions are happening with NFTs because they're very um, they're not small. The 2.3 2.3 billion NFT market volume in August alone, which spiked I don't even know 100 times over since a month or two before. So well, but they 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 don't just represent you know art. I mean, there 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 are these things you know like crypto punks or board apes yacht club or whatever that um, and it's easy to poke fun at because they're just images, but uh, they also convey a uh, certain right. Uh, like people can, like there, there was um, three law or, or Blau, you know, however you want to pronounce uh, his name. He's a musician uh, who, uh, who launched this uh, app this last week called Royal, where people can buy, will be able to buy fractional uh, parts of uh, an artist's royalty stream. And you can build a portfolio and, and not be, you know, um, fairly wealthy <clears throat> so that you can participate in these deals as a, like, like a private investor, um, accredited investor and so on. You can be a smaller investor and buy, you know, a, a small share of, you know, 10 or 20 artists that you like and build a portfolio of royalty streams from that. And they will all be handled as NFTs and so on that, that you'll own. Um, so, so these right. are the but, well, but I agree that makes a lot of sense to 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 do parts of that. But the NFT that I'm talking about is that complete craziness where some crypto punk thing is selling for five and a half million dollars. It's more than some Picasso paintings. So it, it's kind of hard to say that it makes any any sense. Well, it's um. Well, it's a uh, uh, what it is is it's it. Think about it as it's like buying a, a piece of instead of buying. A JPEG, you know, which is the way that it's uh, mocked. You're, you're buying a piece of cultural heritage. If you, I mean, if you really believe in Ethereum as being the start of some um, new uh, type of financial system, which you know, whether it's regulated or not, it is going to keep growing. Then right. it's sort of like a piece of cultural real estate. That you're, that you're buying there's only ten thousand crypto punks well i, yeah. I don't know yeah. to me i'm sorry but that's just quite a stretch it's it's a it's a just an easily duplicatable thing if i'm buying real estate on the ocean i, I can't duplicate it i could live you it can't, I can't you can't it. duplicate crypto punks there's only ten thousand of them and there only ever will be ten thousand of them Meaning, and I could do, I could can, make a copy of it easily well you can make a copy of a picasso i'll draw i'll draw you one today uh, is right. I, I, well, I agree that art markets was just as arbitrary, but the actual real estate market is not. You, you, I can't. But the point is, it. it's a, it, there's, the originals only exist once, just like the Picasso. There aren't gonna, going to be any more Picassos. There aren't going to be any more. Even, Pic even Picasso is a little more difficult to replicate a Picasso painting than didn't take. I a can picture. make a photocopy of it. I can make a. I can make a copy that's museum quality and and print it as a G clay G clay print. You know, that's archival or museum quality, just like what they sell art prints for. And, you know, reproduce it down to a very fine resolution. And does it have any value? No, you know, I could sell it for 10 bucks at a museum store or whatever, uh, because right. it has some, might have some value going on a college student's wall or something. 
dorm wall, but it, a serious collector, an art collector is only going to pay for an original piece that has right, but value. But you actually, a collector actually displays that on the wall. What do I do with the Pudge of Penguins? Well, you can, okay, so let me tell you, for example, what was done by Damien Hurst, who was, um, you know, the, the, uh, been a British artist for some time. He's been a sponsor of bank. He was the first sponsor and biggest sponsor of Banksy, for example, brought him to, you know, prominent, uh, been a collaborator with them, but he was famous on his own for things like, you know, the, the shark, uh, um, the, the full size shark, like suspended in formaldehyde or whatever in the museum mm -hmm. back in the nineties. So he's been around for a long time, but he produced a series of 10,000 pieces that um, were these pointillistic pieces, which is a, a, one, kind of an element of his art over the last, let's say five or six years, he produced 10,000 of them and sold them all as NFTs. But they uh, correspond, each of those 10,000 correspond to a, an actual physical work of art that's in a vault. Now you can claim your um, you can claim your that that physical art in the in the vault uh, and by a certain date it's like one year out and um, or you can leave it as an NFT and if you, if you leave it as an NFT then it's a liquid you can you can put it on the market you can sell it in a matter of days or whatever but if it's physical art. You could claim your physical art and they'll ship it to you, but then they destroy the NFT. If you, but so the NFT gets destroyed. If you, if you keep the NFT, they'll destroy the physical work of art by that date. So you can. They will just destroy the physical work of art? Yes. So the, the, that corresponds to your piece. So it will only at some, you know, one year out, it will only either exist as an NFT or as a physical work of art, but not both. And so you have the right to claim that and you know trans turn it and get the physical work of art, but then your NFT goes away. So it's like, so what what's the what's the value here of the NFT? Well, it's the sort of thing that it um, it it's an indication of your taste and sophistication. And it's like, why do why do collectors by but you could look at the of things. art that cost hundreds of millions of they, dollars. They look pretty. You, you put them on the wall and they look pretty. Again, what do I do with a pudgy penguin or a bored ape yacht NFT or a crypto punk NFT? What do I do what with do? it? Well, it's it, an ugly little piece of JPEG I, I, looking I'm trying like... to answer your question that, that it, it makes you part of a community. And and that I'm I'm telling you, that is the the future of, of fintech is going to be communities and social communities and whether or not people want to believe it is what's emerging right now and NFTs are a piece of that. But how do uh, I know which, that I'm part of the community? If I have a Picasso on the wall, people come to my home and I'm like, look, I have a Picasso, how great they admire. So if they come to my home, how do I tell them I have a Pudgy Penguin? Do I just show it to them on the phone or like... So well, I, well, how do I find other people? About an NFT is that it's verifiable. It has a a it's a instantly verifiable chain of custody. Unlike if you want to sell a work of art that's hanging on your wall, oh, this was done by you know whoever. You know this is a Monet. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of um, fraudulent Monets out there. A lot of fraudulent. Um, you know, works of art out there. How do you verify? Well, they have to have an expert, you know, come and look at it and actually age the piece. And, you know, is there, you know, anything funny going on with this? And still they're providing an expert viewpoint on it. Right. You know, they, they don't, they can't prove it. Whereas with an NFT, you can prove the artist made this, transferred it to me here, transfer it to this person, I sold it here, blah, blah, blah. No, no, blah, I, I get blah. the chain custody thing. And that's the, that's a cool part of Ethereum and all that stuff. But the, the, the fundamental principle of art until today has been that it's a display piece for, for people to put in your home 
for and to show to people versus this you you put it on the black blockchain and i would uh suggest i would suggest i i have art on my walls you can see behind me you know one of them is by a well-known artist um others you know maybe a little bit less well known but you know one of those pieces uh, a, a, a copy of it is hanging in the met and i'm proud of it but on the other hand this you know it's what um i'd say gen z people would say well that's a boomer <laughs> that's just a boomer viewpoint you know that you have to carry all this stuff around with you mm -hmm. and that uh, you don't you can't you know that holding it digitally and that it exists in a digital form that's verifiable instantly and that you're you don't just show people this but this owning this piece of art it might get you exclusive access to a community of artists where you can buy more art that, that only sounds offered like a pyramid people, scheme only offered the people that, or first at this lower price that own one of these you know certain pieces and that it's it's the this these privileges are granted to people or you're in some other you know like like social community that you know you share information that's not um shared widely and and so that's what people feel like they're buying into is they're not buying a jpeg that is just you know sitting on the blockchain somewhere they're buying access into a exclusive community that gives them certain knowledge um and that is privileged knowledge and that, that so they're they're part of a community now and uh and the many of those the, the crypto punks were first being basically given away some of them were being given away um gas was much cheaper on on the ethereum network that, but they were they were sold for a while at about like 0.1 ether which even today would be about uh 400 dollars and so um but back then it was like you know 30 dollars or something and you might pay four or five dollars in transaction fees so you, you know, but it's a sort of thing that a lot of people back then thought, well, it was dumb, you know, why do I want to buy this for $35 and waste $35? And it's like a lunch out somewhere. It's five and, and a half like, million. And I still think it's dumb to but, own it. And well, it but I'm just saying, it was, of course, but, but they made money, good for them, but that but doesn't I'm just make saying, it on. Like January, 2018 people or whatever, uh, 2019 people thought it was dumb because it's like, it's cost $35. Why would I spend that on that? And but now it's you know three hundred and ninety thousand dollars for one. Uh, that's a floor price for one. But I but the reason is, and the reason why uh, this last week, Stephen Curry bought a board eight, for example. Visa announced the Visa Corporation announced that they bought a crypto pump and that they added it to their archive of um commerce related culturally significant commerce items what visa has bought is publicity i understand that they, they bought advertising for them and publicity among the gen z people but my but my point is is it it has whether it's advertising for them or not it has um a a cultural significance that it has to do with the community that entitles someone to join. And there's already crypto punk communities that you have to own one of these in your wallet and uh, to, to enter. And if you don't have that, you don't get it. And, um, and so it's, it's, um, it's a, uh, a mark of, you know, I was, I was here, I was here at, from the beginning, you know, I'm an OG, so to speak. And uh, that, that there's you know, no denying my commitment and my um, foresight, you know, the, these types of things. It's, it's, a, it's a status good in a, in a market where um, basically Ethereum has gone up by 1000% over the last year. And so people have a lot of, you know, people that didn't have much capital before are in a, like, and and the people that were buying the crypto punks, let's say in 2019, were 
people that were, you know, a bunch of, bunch of coders and developers and people that were really into it at a time when it was viewed as, um, uh, it was in a bear market and it was viewed as being uh, less sexy than other asset classes. And so they were, they were committed and they were buying at the time. And it, it, uh, it has a, a kind of street credibility as a result of that. And, and um, it's kind of like, you know, in, in the high art world, the, you know, uh, an artist like a Banksy, you know, got his start as, you know, by doing basically graffiti on, this, on the sides of buildings and so on. Uh, he had a kind of street credibility and uh, as being like an outsider artist. And that is, there's a certain amount of that um, kind of uh, street cred associated with crypto punks. Board Apes is a little bit different. It's newer, but St Stephen Curry did buy but one. Of I think Board Ape is the most appropriate name for all of that stuff. Well, but it's- uh, It's a board. And so we invent those. It's such a waste of human imagination. I feel well, but but uh, you know, it's it's uh, I, I would say that it's it's very much um, sim it's very similar to and, and you may not like Andy Warhol either, but it's the idea of you know, this this uh, uh, reproduction as itself, um, you know, or the art as process instead of art as an object. I mean, that's, you know, there's philosophy behind it. I'm not saying I'm, that's necessarily my taste, but so there's- do you, um, do you own any Pudgy penguins or CryptoPunks or- uh, I don't own any of those. I don't have them um, because I kind of viewed it as, uh, it's kind of dumb, you know, whatever at the time. And uh, I probably, probably should have. I have some NFTs. Uh, there are some of them, uh, the, some of the, NFTs that I do have, they entitle you to like membership in a community. You can you can enter and you've got you know whatever you're a level four instead of a level three or something like that, and it's um, useful information that that makes me a better investor, a better trader. Yeah, and, that makes sense. And so these types of things, yeah. Like, but or there is what's called um, co-ops. You know that that can grant those privileges too, and Co-op stands for proof of attendance protocol. And so they are often given out free or at very low cost or no cost, like or, you know, pretty much free. That if you, you, you attended some conference or something, or you were around a certain community when something significant happened, um, then you, you will be given you know, a link that, that uh, you can get this Poap and it 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 will give you certain like um, uh, privileges down the down the line that you were around when that happened. So you must be, um, you know, a cut above. You know, just the latecomers and uh, the people that are, you know, just rushing in. You know, you were you were actually you went to the meeting, you listened, you contributed, and so on. And so these are all NFTs. Um, another type of NFT that I that I have. Uh, serve of is what's called ENS names, Ethereum name service names. And so these are um, uh, Ethereum addresses are 42 byte, you know, zero X and then 42 bytes after that zero X and they're hexadecimal. And there's no way that you're going to remember your own. I, you could, but <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, right. like if that's your only way of remembering, uh, you're in trouble. But what what this what the Ethereum name service does is all in the blockchain that you buy these names. You want to do this when gas is cheap, but you can buy a name and then you can tie it to your address. So instead of me referring to um, you know zero x whatever, I can um, say well my address is andrewaken.eth, and they can send. Um, you know, I, they, I can refer to my wallet that way. And, and so it's, um, it's, it's uh, uh, a way to, and then that itself has some, like, let's say street cred on in the Ethereum community. You'll see people on Twitter 
that are want to tie themselves to Ethereum, especially that they'll you know have whatever Eric dot ETH or so and so dot ETH, and it's it's um that's their ENS name of their of their wallet. Now it may not be their main wallet, but it's a wallet that that they use for you know minor transactions or something, but they own it. And 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 so all these are NFTs too. So NFTs are a very broad category that it right. and hard. so the ones you described make a lot more sense to me that because they're a lot more practical and have some sort of realistic application in the real world. Uh, yeah, versus... well, art is, um, you know, I, I, my family, you know, there's some artists in my family and um, it's sort of like uh, the, the, you know, me having a, a math background, I think when I was younger, I, I well, art, the purpose of art is to be frivolous, right? It's, it's, and, you know, that's, you know, artists would... <laughs> you know, cringe or, or blanch at that, you know, kind of remark because they view what they do as like, they're, they're bearing their soul. You know, they're, they're putting it all out there for themselves. Now, something like crypto punk, it's not, that's not the purpose of it, bearing their soul or, or putting themselves. It's a punk. Feelings out there. Well, it's a, it's fun. It's intended to be fun. And so the, um, the, the attraction is for for some people is it's sort of like they've got all, they've got disposable money <laughs> right. and they're they're showing <laughs> off their money by being able to buy one of these it's kind of like is it does it make sense to drive around um you know lamborghini uh Countach or whatever no i mean a toyota rav4 will get you there just fine and in comfort but and more comfortably than a Kuntak. But the Kuntak is showing that um, I've got a lot of, you know. Well, it's just a lot uh, easier to show yeah. off your Lamborghini than to show off your crypto punk. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like driving the Lamborghini Kuntak, you know, inside to, of uh, a truck. To the to the to the to the bar, you know, where everybody can see it. And it's it's the equivalent of that on your Ethereum account, and uh, it's 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 very much the same. It's a it's a, a show off thing. I no, the people that bought them early, they're in a different. You know, they that bought them really cheap or got them almost free, they're in a different. It's sort of like, well, they might have bought a couple of them and they sold one for a lot of money, for. Uh, the floor right now is about four hundred thousand dollars. So they they sold one for let's say you know four hundred thousand dollars, and they held on to one just because it's like, hey, I'm gonna show it off, you know. And right. I paid twenty three dollars for it, but if I sold it, I could sell it tomorrow for you know a, a lot. But it's fun to just hold it to show that I was around from the beginning, because you can look at the transaction and see that, hey, I got it on January 4th, 2018, you know, I got it like on day three of this offer and I got it super cheap. And that's the show off and the real show off. I mean, that, that you were, you were really early. So, so it's, um, I, I think it's, you know, it's, 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 but, but the same is true of um, high art that gets sold at some of these auctions for, I mean, most of the, most art that gets auctioned or gets resold, it doesn't sell for tons of money, right? It, it sells for, I mean, it may be, uh, you know, a lot of money, but uh, and it's not cheap, but it might cost, let's say the average art sells for a few thousand dollars, even well-known art. And it's only these prize pieces that are big show-off items that get auctioned off for you know, millions of dollars and so on in the real art world. And the purpose of that is not, you know, it's to show off basically. And um, so, 
so that's what um, I, I uh, yeah. But but there's um, it, it's a it's a mix. There's a it's a it's a unique culture, and these are culturally significant items because it was the it was one of the first NFTs when when the new standard, the ERC seven twenty one standard came out. It was um, one of the very very first that came out. Um, and that was like late 2017 or late 2018. And it was one of the very first that came out. Uh, Crypto Kitties was another one that came out at the time, but that's gotten kind of, they, they kind of didn't really support their community the same way that crypt, the Larva Labs, the company behind CryptoPunk supported theirs. And you know, the Larva Labs really kind of did what they could to build up that, um, you know, we'll keep supporting this and, and um, uh, they built a marketplace, you know, that points to the right place where you, if you want to buy one and how can you get it, you know, the, the cheapest <laughs> one or whatever. And it wasn't until, I want to say, you know, they're up by, you could have gotten one for 10 Ether just five months ago. Now the floor price is 100 Ether. So it's just very, very recently that these exploded in price. Um, and, um, but. Um, well, hopefully people won't get bored of them, pun intended. I think, um, I think, you know, the, the um, it's, you know, it's sort of like any kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a bubble. I mean, it's a, NFTs are in a bubble right now. And, uh, but bubbles don't have no economic significance. They actually do, um, because of the nature of bubbles, they just like, uh, let's say railroads were in a bubble in the late part of the 19th century in the United States. But the fact that a bubble existed allowed all of the infrastructure to get built that wouldn't have been built had it not been in a bubble, in a price bubble. And um, so what, what it allows is there to be, there'll, there'll be a huge amount of money thrown at it because the pricing is so high and it will the you know certain technology will come to pass that wouldn't have come to pass otherwise um had it, had it not been a bubble but the fact is it's not is is it what what's driving ethereum up i don't think so and because there's there's others like cardano that you know that I'm we're looking at hourly right now, but not, and all these just have pulled back a little bit. But but um, you know Cardano's route trading it, it traded uh, just yesterday it traded at an all time high three dollars well, right it's the dollars. third largest digital asset even Bloomberg is talking about it right and so this they're launching smart contracts um, in um, about about ten days. In nine days now, um, so so all of these are are rallying, um, and and even Bitcoin is uh, let's see, even Bitcoin is um, was for a little time back above fifty thousand. I think it'll go back above fifty thousand. Right, but the, the ratio of Bitcoin to Ethereum is through the roof. Uh, well, it's. It's still below where it was in um, April or May, sorry. Well, yeah, but, um, well, it's about to make new all-time highs, right? And this is just still, no, the all-time highs back in uh, 2018, but- um, Oh, they were, okay. But, uh, yeah, it was much higher back oh. then. But uh, it got very close to, Ethereum got pretty close to surpassing Bitcoin and market cap back then. But I, I think that that was a bit of, um, oh, like, it was too much too soon because uh, what's, what's happened with Ethereum and I think that the real innovation, I mean, N NFTs are fun and they're exciting and some of the applications that I mentioned are like, they're, they're real applications, they're real value. And, you know, by the way, for like my ENS names, I paid, you know, like 0 0.05, you know, 0 0.03 Ether or something like that. I mean, they didn't cost, you know, uh, tens or thousands of ether or whatever. Uh, so they, they are relatively cheap, like under a hundred dollars or something to get a certain name. Uh, it's like kind of like reserving um, domain name or something right. like that. But, but um, 
but it's really DeFi, uh, decentralized finance, uh, that is the real driver of value, I think. And part of what we're seeing is the merger of, you know, NFTs are tied up with DeFi. They're, they're not, they're, they're not entirely distinct. And, and so um, I think there's, you know, it's, it's some kind of convergence of these coming one. And then the third thing that's coming where I think uh, both NFTs and DeFi will, will, have, will play together and, and uh, it'll be tied something like Ethereum or maybe other, some other blockchains will be a so-called metaverse. And that's where like uh, vir virtual worlds, you know, and, and it may be the sort of thing that like makes no sense, but it's, it's, um, it's kind of like, you can think of it as a, uh, a merging of commerce and gaming and where, you know, people uh, want more and more realistic games and to the extent that they use like virtual reality headsets and so on, but there are some, um, some platforms like Decentraland, you know, there's others where they build entire virtual worlds. And then like these games can like a, a game, like whatever, you know, um, uh, you know, what, whatever, I'm not going to, you know, name a good one, but you know, they, they exist as like, um, a sub world within that, that world, that virtual world. And, mm -hmm. uh, the term metaverse itself comes from like Neil Stephenson's Snow Crash, which was um, a book that had a lot of influence on the development of these uh, virtual worlds and so on. But I, I think I see that converging. There, there are several, um, several coins that are trading on Ethereum that have been building up these virtual virtual worlds. And I, I see that as fitting into this uh, as, as well. So it may be the next, the next bubble after NFTs. Most of the NFT apparently trades with the OpenSea. OpenSea is a, just what? a marketplace, right? It's a marketplace. Oh, okay. But, yeah, Are they open, trading open. somewhere? Can one buy OpenSea? Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no token for it and they're not okay. planning on having one, uh, but there is one. Uh, there, there are some that have like some of these marketplaces that have um, a token. Uh, one that just launched in the last few weeks is called Super Rare. And uh, it, it, I would say they focus more on high art. It's not like CryptoPunks and things like that, not on there, but these are uh, legitimate artists that they're just selling virtual, you know, virtual art. And they've been around for several years and they just released a token and did an airdrop to their customers and to their artists. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's, that, I, I actually think that that um, might be, um, it might be a good buy actually yet. Uh, not quite yet. I think, um, let me see if I can uh, find it on here. Look, um, the, uh, it just started trading. So it's, yeah, here we go. So they're going to give it to me in terms of ether. Uh, so it's a little confusing, maybe, but uh, the price it won't be. It'll it'll be in terms. But um, yeah, it, uh, this is. Um, it was not trading back in. I think this is something else. That this is the entire history here. So mm -hmm. um, it was something else called rare, but. This is the entire history here that it it uh, launched here and it went up to like basically a bit almost three dollars per um, per token and it's pulled back a bit. Also, Ethereum has rallied here. This is in Ethereum terms, but the um, but I think that could be a good buy under a, under one dollar per token um, because it it does um, it gives you basically a share of the a share of the platform and you know, governance rights and you could decide to vote for whatever share of revenues or something like that if you wanted uh, just like uh, you have with stock um but but um it's not quite too good value yet it, it got a little hiked up but um mm -hmm. 
but I but but OpenSea does not have. Um, I I don't see them ha having a. Um, so a, they they are private organization who just collects the fees facilitating the sales, correct? They they collect a share a, a small share, but then but what's um what's what's pretty interesting is you know they they do more than just that uh, they <clears throat> they also there could be like for example if you uh, create some something that's popular and it uh, gets traded a lot and it and it resells and it might not be something really expensive it could be pretty cheap it, that the the artist the person that created it could get a share every time it resells and so I think that's where the, it's really exciting uh, is for creators that how, how many how many artists are just struggling to get by? I mean, they, they have good product, uh, good art, but do they do they make money every time their art resells from one person to another? No, they don't even know. And and so what this mm -hmm. enables is for an artist to continue to get a revenue stream from a piece because they get a share of the sale price every time it sells. And I, I think this has um, uh, encouraged some artists to, like Damien Hurst, uh, uh, the example I was using, where he's an um, artist, uh, traditional media, and, and has uh, decided to do at least one series of NFTs, but he'll get you know, some kind of share of all the resale revenue, um, you know, indefinitely. And, uh, and uh, you know, how many, I mean, it's sort of like the dream of artists uh, for centuries, you know, ever since aristocratic or ecclesiastical patronage stopped. I mean, how, how, you know, you, you really have to struggle to be, to be an artist unless you really hit it big. But this um, provides a way for an an artist that makes you know good things that that they could get some kind of revenue stream from a piece indefinitely. Um, it's it's kind of like if you're a musician and you're you 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 know your your piece is played on the radio, right? And the radio station has to pay the, your mm -hmm. your company a royalty for playing that, right? And so. Uh, um, a um, musician, at least, they get that royalty stream. But traditional, like um, visual artists, you know, there's no way for them to to collect that unless, like, their piece is shown on, uh, you know, uh, some sort of commercial venue, right? Then, uh, or hung in a gallery or something, they might get something from that, but not the resale. And so that's where I think it it will continue to encourage a certain blending of um, and traditional media and NFTs and artists will want to do NFTs because of, of it's very favorable for them from a revenue standpoint. Well, it's interesting. So how would Ethereum, how would this, well, you're saying this is not exactly affecting Ethereum much, but Ethereum is almost that all time. It's not like it's pushing a price up, I don't think. I mean, I, alone. Not this alone. It's not like I think like back in let's say 2017, a major um, push on, up on the price was due to ICOs. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's it's quite the case because there's there's many other applications going on with Ethereum too, like decentralized finance, where I mean you can get very nice returns in DeFi compared to traditional um, investments. And, and the transaction fees are paid in Ethereum there too. And some of the best apps are on Ethereum. So you, you don't have to even play with NFTs at all to be interested in, in Ethereum. And, and um, so I think that the, um, yeah, the uh, uh, and, and the other thing that's, that's happened but but I but I, I think that it's um, there's multiple things that are driving the price of DeFi, um, the, the the upcoming merge, uh, the burn due to EIP fifteen fifty nine, mm -hmm. um, sure NFTs these all of these things are you know celebrities uh, uh, pumping it, uh, 
the, all these things are um, are driving the price. And um, I, you know, I, I I do think. I mean, I was really surprised at the um, how quick and the extent of this move. I didn't anticipate it. I thought that we might struggle around the 3,300 to 3,500 range for a while. And we might still, it, it could easily pull back here and um, you know, jog around in that range a little bit because it's unlike, like if you look in this range and then in this range, it spent some time there mm -hmm. and you know, touched a lot of different prices um, in those ranges. But up here and kind of, the, you know, the, the, in the mountains here, it's like the air is a little thinner still. We haven't touched a lot of these different prices as much. And so I'm thinking that it might, um, might pull back a bit and spend some time um, trading, in some, trading in this range here. And I may trade broadly in this range, but, but, um, but th that's just a, you know, an, intuit an intuitive observation. Not, I don't know that that will happen, but it's just my intuition that might pull back a bit here. But the thing that could um, could happen, um, I I do think that you know Bitcoin here has just been kind of hanging out and is mm -hmm. still below right now is just a bit below fifty thousand. And I do think that that Bitcoin is going to rally now. What what happened as Ethereum was rallying is Bitcoin didn't go anywhere. It would actually pull mm -hmm. back a bit. And so we might see the opposite happen here, where Ethereum pulls back a little bit and Bitcoin rallies. But but that's not um, it's it's a it's a um, a changing market, and I think that there is a bit more a bit less correlation between Ethereum and Bitcoin as there was in the past. And I think we'll see that continue to decline that correlation uh, even in a bear market. So. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, just going on the, based on the past, I think that it's more likely we might see a bit of a, a bit of a churning around just below this 4,000 level, which is a really, I, I think there's a lot of psychological resistance there because um, it didn't spend very long above 4,000 mm -hmm. back here in May. And um, I, I, I think it'll be, it, it will break above 4,000 convincingly, but maybe not right away. It'll take a little time to get there. And um, I do think though that Bitcoin breaking above 50,000 is pretty much, uh, it's gonna happen. Uh, how, whether it goes you know, back to the, whatever, 65,000 range, well, that's immediately, I don't think so, but I do think it'll break above 50 and then stay in the 50s for a little while. But, but I do think uh, Ethereum will, might, might uh, turn around just below 4,000, just as it did here below the, um, uh, the 3,200 level um, mm -hmm. for a while. So I, I, I think that's um, more likely. It would be healthy if that happened uh, for the, the longer term. What I would say is uh, the one thing I would add about NFTs is that one of the things that has dr driven the, the price of CryptoPunks up and is driving uh, some other NFT prices up is what's called fractionalization, where um, there's a um, tokens where you can trade like shares of a CryptoPunk <laughs> and you can buy a fraction mm -hmm. of a CryptoPunk. And so um, there's obviously an arbitrage, there's an arbitrage opportunity because you could take whatever one of these whole tokens and so buy, you could buy 0 0.0001 of them, but you could buy one. If you buy a, a full one, then you could trade it for a crypto punk. If you have a crypto punk, then you can, you can trade it or exchange it one-to-one -one for one of these tokens. And so um, you can, so there's an arbitrage opportunity. There's a deviation in price. And so if the fractional shares are going up, it's going to push the price of a full crypto up too. 
that's something that's emerged just in the last, I would say three, four months. And so I think that's been a, a big driver of the price increases is um, it was trading, even trading at 10 ether, which today is $40,000. I mean, that's out of reach of most people you know, by art, right? I mean, <laughs> how many people are buying art for $40,000? Um, but if they want to buy 0 0.01 of it, $400, that might be, you know, a good part of their overall portfolio or something. And so they, um, and whatever, 4,000, you know, you understand what I'm saying. Right, right. Well, it, it gets fraction. worse. Not only you cannot buy this piece of art and hang it on the wall, now you can't even buy the whole thing. You're buying a piece of something that is somewhere on the blockchain that you don't fully own. And it's... it's well, there's a, there's a token that's been around for a while uh, that's called... So there was an artist uh, who sold a piece for something like $69 million. And this was back in February. And it's, it goes by the name Beeple. And um, he, this was sold on the Ethereum chain for something like $69 million. And, um, the, um, and, and then ether prices, which were about like, eight, like, like 2000 per ether. Now it's nearly double that. So it'd be even more or, you know, over uh, like 130 million. But, but, um, but regardless, there's um, a token that trades on uh, Uniswap on, on Ethereum that is called uh, Beeple 20, B20. And it, they own um, like a set of 20 of his artworks. And they uh, say that they, they've got them all up for sale on different um, platforms. And so if you hold this token, it, if one sells, then you'd get a share of the revenue from each of those until all 20 sell. So, yeah, it's, there's, that's existed for a while. That's existed since February. And there are some people that um, uh, have kind of speculated that the person behind that was using it to pump the price up for that one piece that was being sold at auction. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you know, these types of things have, have existed for a while. Uh, so there's, there's this uh, ability to buy very small increments, you know, Bitcoin or an Ethereum or of uh, something like this that's been tokenized. And, uh, and I think that's, that's one of the things that uh, uh, blockchain enables that would be very hard to do in, um, in like real life finance or traditional finance. I remember back in the 90s when there were the so-called things like the Bowie bonds that were issued, right? David Bowie's like a revenue stream that tied to these uh, a securitized, yeah, it was a securitized revenue stream of his royalties. How and should that work out? I, I think they, well, I think they work out really well. If you, if I, I don't think it uh, uh, was his whole catalog or anything like that. I think it was like a certain slice, certain slices of it. And he kept making music after that. And I don't think that was included in that. I just think he wanted to kind of cash in on some of his royalties, right? Uh, I think it worked out for those people pretty well. They held them, you know, to maturity. Then they, I think they made out pretty well. But, but those types of things, I mean, you, you couldn't have just like gone down to Charles Schwab and said, I want to buy some Bowie bonds or whatever. It was the sort of thing that, um, you know, it, like like hedge funds or whatever would have uh, mm -hmm. held, and it would have been brokered by an investment bank and and so on. So it would have been limited to just a very small set of investors that were, you know, had, had a lot of money. And but these types of things are essentially making these types of like high finance um, options available to ordinary investors that, that so it's um right. it, that that's one of the things that's like i think is very exciting on the other hand if you don't know what you're doing with money then you're going to lose money 
Um, and and um, it, it's the same thing with anything else. I mean, you can, well, you know, people are making tons of money on options. Well, but they've studied them and they know what they're doing. And if you think that you're going to triple your money in options just by taking chances, then you're probably going to lose everything. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing here that uh, unless you know what the what the art market is about and what the NFT market really how it really functions, which I don't. And that's why I'm not I don't really play in that space. Um, and you're probably going to lose money if, it, if it's not an area where you have good knowledge. Um, so why, why would you, why would you play against people that are much more sophisticated than you? Um, you know, you're kind of like the sucker at the poker table, right? If, if, you know, and, and that's, um, you know, I, I would be very cautious about uh, seeing it as a, as a good speculation, unless you really understand the market well. Thanks for the explanation. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess that's it for me for today. Same here. So, all right. Thank you. Everybody right. have a great weekend and we'll talk to you next Friday.